Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 144, the inaugural SeanCon. Thoughts on 11 different games we played at SeanCon. I'm Sean, yes, that's Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, this past weekend, Sean was down in Windsor, and we launched the inaugural SeanCon gaming convention, with an, which involved 19 plays of 11 different games. And I want to hear Sean's thoughts on each of those games. After that, we've got a review of our most played game from SeanCon, Draconis Invasion. And I've got a review of Code Monkeys Going Banana, a programming game that I've been playing with my kids quite a bit this past week. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, a comment on our White Star Galaxy Edition review on YouTube. Finger commented to say, there is a supplement for additional classes and rules to play a Star Trek game five-year mission. That is pretty awesome. Thanks for the heads up on that, and I'll be sure to drop a link to it in the show notes. Well, next, a few comments on our one-player fantasy game suggestions from last week. Starting with Mike Riley, who writes, That's a great selection of fantasy games that can be played solo. Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion, and Lord of the Rings, J-I-M-E, a, a Journey into Middle-Earth. Journey into Middle-Earth. Are my favorites. Too many acronyms. A good dice checker game that flies under the solo radar is Masmora Dungeons of Arcadia. It can be played cooperative or competitive, which means if you don't mind controlling two characters, it can be played solo. Ooh. Now, Brock Wager, uh, Wager tweeted, I love Dra Legacy of Dragonholt solo. And Jeremy Powell has a correction for us. Point of order. Lord of the Rings, the card game, was fourth living card game from Final Fantasy games, not the first. It was the first cooperative Fantasy living card game. Games. Games. Fantasy flight games. Though, and it's not long out of print, aside from a few minor expansions, expert level nightmare decks and print on demand scenarios that have indeed been taken out of print, it is all still in print, though at any moment, many of the expansions will be out of stock and between printings, which isn't the same as out of print. It's also my pick for the best solo game experience ever made. Nice. All right. So let's work backwards here, I think. Let's start with Jeremy's comment. So thanks for the correction. Um, this one I blame on my source, though I probably should have done some digger deeping. Digging, sorry, digger deeping. Wow, the, word, the words are backwards tonight. Digging, I, I can't even do it. Digging deeper into this. So here was the, where I got my information from. It said, Lord of the Rings, the card game, was the first ever living card game, LCG. Every month, the manufacturer releases new adventure packs, heroes and serios. If you want to make playing board games an ongoing hobby, whether alone or for the entire family, we recommend you try this out. That was from happierhuman.com slash solo board games with hyphens between there. So I saw that. And then I went to Board Game Geek, and in the Board Game Geek listing, it explains what an LCG is, as if it's a new concept. So with those two things combined, I just thought it was the first ever LCG. I don't play LCGs. I don't pay attention to LCGs that much. I tried Android, and I tried Star Wars, and I didn't really like either, and I kind of stopped after that. So my bad for, I guess, not digging deeper. Now, as for the out of print mistake, that one's 100% fine. I can't blame anyone else for this one. Um, I just hear people complaining about not finding stuff for the game constantly and knowing the game's old, like in board game years, right? It's like 2011 or something like that. It's been around for, yeah, it is 2011. It's been around for 10 years at this point. So I just assumed it was out of print. So please take this as my correction to what I said about Lord of the Rings, the card game last week. Now, when I do get around to writing up a blog post on this topic of solo fantasy games, I'll make sure to include those corrections. Now, moving back, thanks, Brock, for the comment and Mike for the game suggestion. Now, I own Arcadia Quest, which is like the first part of Mass Mora. Mass Mora was a, a new version of Arcadia Quest or a follow-up. And I dig Arcadia Quest. That can't be played solo, though. So I actually had no idea Mass Mora could be played solo. But I haven't played it either way. So what I will do, though, is I'll toss a link to that in the show notes. Well, next up, a very nice comment from Kim Brebeck 
who is one of the developers at Good Games Publishing, as well as a board game content creator. Kim gave us a great shout out on Twitter and then contacted Mo to say, at Tabletop Bellhop, your reviews of Unfair and Funfair have been fantastic, reasonable, considered, and insightful. <laughs> you played each numerous times and you clearly understand the intent of and audience for each game. I'm so glad you replayed Unfair numerous times and learned that the strategy in the disaster mitigation and management is absolutely an intended part of the game. That it adds depth and tension and drama and a certain kind of fun. This shows the importance of reviewers playing a game multiple times to really understand the design choices. Thanks. Well, thanks so much for this, Kim. I, again, I've said this many times on the on the show before. I love it when publishers share our stuff. And well, even more so when they appreciate the work we do do on our reviews, which may be more or less than some other people. But we at least do give the games multiple tries before talking about them. And I'm glad that's got noticed. Now, we should be reviewing another good games publishing game next week if everything goes according to plan. And that will be Guildmaster. And the only thing holding that one up is actually wanting to play it again. I need to play a two-player game with Deanna and I just to give it a shot once more two-player now that we both know the rules and have played multiple times. So you can look forward to that one next week. Finally, let's wrap up with a couple of anniversary comments. Jason G. Wallace writes, Congratulations on the anniversary, the big 03. Many more, please. And Mark from Grand Gamers Guild tweeted, Congratulations, on three years. Well, thanks, Jason and Mark, for the well wishes. We appreciate it. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. A couple of things we want to mention before we get on to answering this week's question. All right, as of today, you've got one week left, seven days to enter our Watergate with box insert giveaway that's live now over on the blog. Again, that's for those of you here live on Wednesday. When this hits on Tuesday, you're going to have one day to enter. Use the link in the show notes, scroll down on the homepage, or find a link on the blog under Tabletop Gaming Deals to enter. Good luck. Now, for those of you listening at home, I really hope you're able to join us for Extra Life Tabletop Appreciation Weekend this past weekend. Thank you, all of you who stopped by, and an even bigger thanks for those who donated. You rock. Remember, you can donate now by hitting the donate button at windsorextralife.com. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, I'm going to be the one asking the question, and that question is, what were the games you got to play during SeanCon, and what did you think of them? Well, the past weekend, I was down in Windsor with the express purpose of hanging out with Deanna and Mo, and of course, playing some games. Now, while I knew it was going to be a big game-filled weekend, I never quite predicted just how many different games we would end up playing. And at some point during the weekend shenanigans, I was sharing pictures of the games we were playing and I was logging them on Board Game Geek, so that all ends up in my social media. Some on my Twitter feed noted they thought I was at a con. They're like, oh, what con are you at? But, and I'm like, oh, I'm not at a con. And they're like, well, with all the games you're playing, you must be at a con. And it was then that I got the idea that I'm like, well, Sean's down. Sean's down specifically to play games that I wanted Sean to play. So we're going to call this Sean Con. And I got to say, I like that name. It works. Well, though, to be fair, certain members of the team think we should have played more. Yeah. But that was on me. I did choose sleep at one point. No comment. <laughs> Now that Sean Con's over, I actually think we're going to try to make this a regular thing. We actually talked about it at the end of the weekend on Sunday. And kind of like how there's like a PAX East and a PAX West and a Dice Tower West and a Dice Tower, whatever. All the, Some of these big cons have multiple cons. So I'm thinking we need Sean Con Spring, Sean Con Summer, Sean Con Winter, and Sean Con Fall at a minimum. That'll make this weekend that just went by the inaugural Sean Con. I guess it could also be Sean Con Summer, with hopefully more to come. Trademark pending, dates TBD. <laughs> Sorry, enough about future of Sean Con. Let's get to the games that we actually played this past weekend. 
So it started off, uh, Deanna was busy with my mom. So I looked over at my shelves and I'm like, oh, we have all these games we want to play, but Deanna needs to be involved for most of them. Like the main ones we wanted to get to, we wanted all three of us. So I looked over my shelves for a two player game that I was pretty sure Sean had never played before. Like I wanted one of the ones we mentioned on the show week after week. Like we talk about the Duke a lot. Sean's played that. We talk about other Takedo, how good it is two player. Sean's played that. So I was looking around and I ended up grabbing p- patchwork which is one that tends to come up on every two player recommendation on light game recommendations, as well as unique themed games. We've talked about patchwork a lot. Well, I, you know, I've played this one once or twice uh, on the computer uh, with a steam download from humble bundle. I, you know, mm-hmm. with all the, all the Asmodee games, uh, but never in person. And while honestly, I would say many games do actually, especially the more complex ones, actually end up being better digitally this one is not one of those (laughs) though it is simple and straightforward and there's no reason to digitize moving around you know some tetris pieces plus other humans aren't the ai in that game that (laughs) That just does insane things that i don't understand there's something about this game too that I think you need the tactile nature. Like polyominoes are meant to be manipulated and touched and flipped and remembering you can flip them. And it's an important part of scoring well in patchwork. And, but I agree. I have played patchwork many times and I usually score what I think is okay. And I got the app and I played it and I was like, Whoa, I, I, I guess I don't know how to play patchwork. I don't know what it is. I'm missing. Now, we ended up playing two games. The first one was extreme just because I can't follow a scoring path, or maybe I can. I'm not sure because the second game did seem like we were about the same spot. And, well, I, we played poorly, I think. <laughs> like, just just overall, like, we were struggling to get positive points, which I know is kind of a thing in patchwork. Uh, it is hard not to get a negative score in this if you're inexperienced. But even being experienced, I don't know. That game's just, for how light and fluffy and fun it is you do that in-game scoring and it's kind of soul crushing yeah and i would never say i'm good at it but playing it in person instead of against that ai really does make you rethink the game and go from something that's oh i'm just gonna uninstall that and and (laughs) move on to oh absolutely i'd I'd play that to go to table again anytime so what we got to do next is try it on board game arena since it's on there and see how it works there yeah because definitely playing against a person is different so that was the first game of Sean Con. That was Patchwork. Now, next up, I ended up grabbing one of the oldest games on my pile of obligation. Um, I don't even know what possessed me. It's been there forever. We basically decided we were not going to actually review this um, due to previous experiences with a full game so there is a full board game called stratos what i grabbed is the light in darkness expansion from board and tail games now this is a standalone expansion for a bigger game that its selling point supposedly is that it is a mashup of dungeons and dragons and Catan. so this is an interesting game <laughs> uh as mo mentioned uh you know, and, and called it, called it, it's someone's passion project. Yes. Uh, my immediate thought as I was going through this was Cones of Dunshire from the TV show Parks and Recreation. One of those games that a group just put everything into, but yes. didn't have people from the outside looking at it, maybe pointing out some things that they might want to dial back or, or rethink and, and adjust. Um. You know, it's just one of those things where sometimes too much love can blind you from some of the failings that have cropped up along the way. Yeah, this is one of those games that just feels unfinished. But if you call it that, the designer will show up to point out they've been working on it for 10 years. It is definitely a passion project for a small group of gamers. I personally kind of dig this game. There's just something quaint about it. Like, like I can tell what they were trying to do. And I almost appreciate the stuff. Like they have this system where you stand these and you slot things on them. So the information is always on the board, which sounds good in theory until you see it and you get the cardboard pieces and you fight to get them on. And then you realize when you put them at 
arm's length are unreadable anyway. And like just the concepts there and it, it's so close. And then they added these D and D like attack rolls, but to do everything. So if you want to harvest resources, you got to roll. If you want to attack someone, you got to roll. When you explore, you got to roll and there's a chance to fail. And it's a high chance, like 25% chance you get no resources, which just isn't fun. I, it just it's it's so almost there and like i've got to be honest i've got the original game in my to get rid of pile i'm probably going to put the expansion there but i'm going to feel bad getting rid of it like i just i feel like it, there's a group out there that would love this game and i think they'd be role players who are going, going to dive into board games i just think they'd be obsessed with this game yeah it's, it's it's one of those things where again they haven't done anything extremely wrong like nothing right. is just this is game breakingly wrong none of it but there are things that just a, a tiny shift could do things better. Yeah. Like instead of slotting things onto your character, cards or, or you know, something in front of you uh, mm -hmm. that would last longer and be more readable and more usable than the interesting but ultimately fiddly and problematic slotting mechanism they yeah. chose with. Um, little things like that. Like just, again, it's all just tiny little details that uh you know a professional external editor and developer probably could probably have helped thought. point out and and uh deflect before mm -hmm. the game made uh made publishing it's got some concepts that are that are interesting and yep. it it wasn't a disaster it wasn't a oh my god this is a one on board game geek uh nope. but because of some of its failings it just felt like it didn't reach the level that I'm sure it is for these creators. I'm, I'm sure yes. the game is is a 10 out of 10 for these creators. Mm -hmm. No question about it. You can feel the love. Unfortunately, outside of that group, with a yeah. discerning eye, some of the flaws start to appear. Yeah, I mentioned this on our Sunday brunch when we mentioned this game. It really feels like a game that someone would have brought to us when we were back at the University of Windsor at the gaming club. And now and then people would show up with their homebrewed games. And this feels like one of those. It feels like something some of our friends back at that time would have showed up with. And to be honest, back in the 90s, we probably would have been blown away by this game. Yeah, no, absolutely. So that was the second game of Sean Khan, Stratos, Light in Darkness. Now I'm going to take a moment to address the chat room here because Red Meeple Ryan has said that Sean Con is even more exclusive than the Gathering of Friends. One of my life goals is to get invited to the Gathering of Friends. So one of one of my one of my goals as an as a uh, content creator is to somehow get well known enough to to get invited to that. Second comment to that is is it would be fantastic if this actually did kind of blow up like that and became. A, a Canadian gathering of friends where we actually like rent a hall and have an actual con based on this weekend. That would be awesome. All right. As we're wrapping up Stratos uh, again, there's light versus darkness expansion, which is standalone. Tori and Kat showed up with their Tim Hortons and everything and some awesome uh, spicy meat sticks. And we paused for some charcuterie dinner. Now, once that was done, we broke out the first big game of the night. This is one we've been planning on playing for two weeks. It was one of our plans was to play this with Tat, Tat and Corey. I'm just like slupsisms all over. Is that the right term? I, I can't even remember the term for them now. All over the place. Um, it's Tapestry from Stonemeyer Games. Now, we've talked about Tapestry quite a bit. And we did talk about how Sean and I did play with Tabletopia. And wow, that was a disaster. How, what did you think about the game getting to physically touch it? Well, I have to say, in some ways, uh, it was kind of a relief. Um, <laughs> I was expecting to like this game. I could see past the problems of the Tabletopia interface and feel like I was going to like this game. And I did. I really did. Uh, I think the... Uh, I played my Civ well. I don't think any of us were going to touch D, that game. I think that yeah. was from, from pretty much turn one. She had a... a direction and a goal that was heading for a uh, serious victory. Uh, but I played my Civ well, if not expertly, because again, mm -hmm. I'm still, there's, there's still a lot about this game to learn. There is a level of system mastery involved, uh, but I really enjoyed the five player version. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't find it dragging between round, uh, between my own turns as much as I expected it to. Um, there is enough that it's like, oh, I'm finishing up doing this so you can go ahead that yes. goes on and things like that, that it really, even with five players and, and, you know, some real decisions that have to get made, it doesn't drag anywhere near as much as I expected it to. 
Now, what about the end? You went, you were the first one out. Like you went into era five before anyone else. And you had a good four or five rounds there where you weren't even playing. Uh, yeah, no, it, it didn't bother me at all. Like it wasn't good. that. And it was really only about three rounds, I think. Was it and three? it was interesting. Well, I because... think it was five, but it got down to just D and I, and we were just like, bang, bang, bang. I yeah, do this, possibly. I do this, and I, I mean, this. there was the interesting aspect of um like the 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 wedding between cat and yes d so you know there were things that were still happening yeah. with one player who was out of it i i unfortunately yeah, i made some some poor choices and didn't get First any link so my end up uh my, my end scoring uh ended up ended far too early even though i i stepped out you can still score after that mm-hmm. point if you have set something up and unfortunately yep. i didn't uh, in, in hindsight, I probably should have taken my other civilization, but I didn't specifically because never I had it. already played them before. Yeah, uh, it was the one I played on Tabletopia, and I wanted to try something different. Again, if you know, if I'm gonna get a new experience with the game in a new way, why rely on uh, part oh, of yeah. the game I'd already done before? Totally fair. One of the comments you made right at the beginning that I really liked was you touched it like, "Ooh, these boards are nice." The, the textured yeah. quality. That, that stops yeah, you'd mentioned that you'd mentioned it a few times during the show. So you know, to finally actually feel it, uh, you're like, oh no, okay, this is yeah, I understand what they've done here. Yep. This makes a lot of sense. Why couldn't they do that uh, with the boards on uh, uh, Mars? Space um, base, space base, terraforming yes. Mars, space base. Well, space base especially. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it would help that little it bit. It would. <laughs> so that was Sean Con Game Three Tapestry. Now, we had the next game planned out, too. So this was another big one. I knew this was going to be epic. Um, I really have been wanting to introduce Tori and Kat to Adventuria, especially playing Gloomhaven with them, right? Another co-op fantasy game. I know they're into D&D and, and those tropes. So since it was their first time playing, I broke out the Master Taylor Poltergeist demo kit, and we played that first. Now, Sean had played that before, so we got to see it. Deanna just took a short break. She took a little nap, which is fair. Um, and as expected, Tori and Kat really dug it and were eager for more. They're like, oh, this seems really neat. I can see where it's going. I want to try it. So then we broke out Forest of No Return, which I'm still playing through in order to review at some point. So again, these uh, we, we have played, Deanna and I played one scenario, and we played the second short scenario. So a bunch of die rolls, then a boss fight, that's it uh i think that went really well so yeah so i unlike the horrible tapestry implementation the tabletop simulator version of aventuria has been really great so honestly Mm -hmm. it felt like i'd played this any number of times already i'd never actually physically touched the cards Oh, for some reason i thought you had no i mean i'd gone i'd actually i'd looked through them when i was down but yeah for some reason i was thinking you played and i'd never actually played physically before Okay. Uh, but again, it didn't feel like I hadn't. Uh, the tabletop mm-hmm. simulation uh, simulator version is that comfortable and familiar. Yeah. The cards are all direct scans. So I just sat down with a deck and started playing. Um, and now I hadn't played the mage before. So that was a, yep. di- a bit of a different twist. But again, they all play similarly enough that you just yep. have to remember you're going to be using your magic skill instead of, you know, your... Uh, whichever skill you, you know, for the rogue, yeah, it was usually melee, uh, melee or, or, uh, or ranged. ranged. So, uh, you know, again, it felt really nice. Uh, and, and this, uh, they're definitely a, a, uh, a pattern to the adventures. Mm-hmm. You're going to die. Everything is horrible. Nothing is going to work. And there's no way you'll make it out alive. And then about round three or four, you're like, Oh, well, maybe we got this. Hey, maybe, maybe we are going to make it through this. Yep. And then a few rounds later, you're like, okay, we got this. Let's just kill yeah. these guys and get out of here. <laughs> and it was awesome because, like, I kind of explained that was going to happen. And Tori, a cat in particular who hadn't played before, were like, oh, no, there's no way. We're doomed. We're doomed. I got to say that beginning felt harder with five players because, just because of the number of things that were out. But then at the end, five felt like too much. Well, and again, part of the problem was we couldn't tell them to, we, we couldn't get them to stop rolling the bad dice. Well, yes, uh, there was that. <laughs> Uh, I, I have to say, you know, people talk about dice and it's like, oh, there's no such thing as bad dice and good dice. Well, let me tell you, we rolled the original dice for our for our characters and the newer dice from the expansion for the Personal monsters. And it made a huge difference. Uh, yeah. They weren't they, 
they don't feel random again without no. we don't have enough i don't have enough uh data to say that uh with certainty but they certainly felt like they were rolling a lot higher overall yeah yeah the the dice in arsenal of heroes at least my copy are terrible like really terrible and people didn't believe me and i'm like you don't actually want like i was i was teasing people saying roll this roll this you got it oh you're making a melee attack you gotta use a melee die and tori was all in deanna was half in and then then most of us by the end had switched to just the black dice oh yeah um yeah no it was crazy i mean with the to you know for people who aren't aware uh when you're rolling a monster attack generally if you roll anything above 15 or so the, it's they're not going to do anything or they're going to do something minor that doesn't affect you. Uh, mm -hmm. So by picking up one of the dice from that expansion and rolling that as the monster dice, they monsters weren't doing all that much. Yeah. <laughs> Generally, um, they, they mostly avoided their uh, their actions. Slight spoiler in this adventure. When you roll really high, the monsters do stuff to each other. And that happened a lot. Yeah. So there is one other thing I do want to bring up about this expansion because we haven't mentioned it tonight and I'll definitely get into it more is the adult nature has not changed. So I noted when Deanna and I played through the first short story, there was body horror, um, mutilation, over the top gore. And uh, we were kind of taken aback because none of that is in the base game or in the demo kit. We're like, well, where did this come from? Like, this isn't the adventure I was playing. And we were thinking of introducing it to the kids till that point. Whoa, what'd this one have? <laughs> well, yeah, this one uh, kind of shocked us. And again, it th this is all stuff you could skip over. If you took the time as, you know, the DM or, or you know, the whoever was managing the, the game the and sat yeah. down and did a pre-read, uh, you could pre -ed you could edit this. But as we were reading through Cold, all of a sudden there's all this sexual and bestiality, <laughs> uh. you know, mention. And again, it's not graphic, but it's there. Uh, yes. And it's there enough that it's something you, you probably don't want to have as the introduction to your kids yeah. for these topics. <laughs> it's not a good starting point. Yeah, you don't want to be sitting in the middle of a game of adventure and be like, okay, so an orgy is when. Yeah, that's just not what you want to talk about. Nope. Plus, like, the, even the story tone was girl abused by her father that runs away and joins a cult. Only like, Even that's... Yeah, Barely. and you are you are hired as yeah, her father you're going to, get her back. to drag her back to the abusive father, mm -hmm. which again, problematic content. Yeah, uh, no question. So it's definitely be aware. <laughs> I don't know how the future of Venturia. I'm kind of hoping they lean a little away from this and keep it a little less. And I, I people could be fine with this if you don't mind adult content in your game. And to be honest, I don't think anyone at our table was actually disturbed by this nope. or bothered by it, but it's just, it's shocking. You don't expect it. it and it's, it's notable and it's something that should be, people should be it made should aware be a of. Session zero. Yeah. Yeah. The, people need to be made aware of before getting into this. And that's one thing I don't think this game does well enough is prepare people. No, it for doesn't this, broadcast you. This uh, sort of information. And if you do have uh, triggers, that could come up if you know if you have been an abused child of a an abusive parent, uh, there is content here which could be yeah. annoying, uh, you know, frustrating and and, and disturbing to you. Uh, and there's nothing to indicate that on the box or no, in the rulebook. Not at all. Yeah, this is uh, we've mentioned it before that X cards aren't necessarily just for RPGs. And every time we bring it up, people are like, "Well, what kind of game would you board game would you? What kind of thing in a board game come up?" Well, this is one. I could totally see having an S-card, like someone just tapping it and either stopping the adventure there or making sure the narrator completely edits out all mention of it. Like, and to be honest, as we kind of complained about an adventure, yet, none of this really matters. You're just making a bunch of checks that modify the start of the combat. If you really wanted to, you can jump right to the combat. Like, just make a, yep. make a perception check, make a willpower check. Oh, you failed. You lose a fate point. You're only going to draw two cards. Let's go right to the fight. Yep. All right, that was the Adventuria Adventure card game. Two different games, one with Master Taylor's Poltergeist and the other with Forest of No Return for Sean Con Game 4. Now, at this point, after our pretty heavy games, it was getting later in the night. There was some beer being drank, not by everyone. Some people were taking part, some weren't. Uh, we swapped over to lighter games. And I have been wanting to play this game off my pile of shame since getting it, and that is Dude which was not at all what I expected. Yeah. Um, it was amusing 
but it it kind of wore out its welcome swiftly uh you know it was you know, let, let's play this okay let's put this back into the box and yeah. move on so what i thought dude was was some kind of trivia game where you're trying to pe- get people to guess an answer but the only word the clue giver could use is dude that is not what this is this is instead more of a retheme of happy salmon or than the other games based on it where you've got a word card that says dude on it written a certain way you try to say dude to match how that word's written and then find someone else around the table who's saying it the same way make eye contact confirm that you think you're both saying the same dude then say sweet and reveal your cards and if they're right they go in the middle of the table first one out of their cards wins like i literally just taught you how to play dude and i i it was fun like i i I can't decide if i'm keeping this or putting it in the extra life pile because there are certain times and certain nights i think this would be awesome the 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 7 a.m on new year's or the you know certain time during extra life though i I think at this point we're probably not doing 24 hours at extra life anymore but even then late at night at extra life i think it could be fun yeah yeah again it wasn't horrible it just wasn't a great game it's certainly something that you're not gonna sit there and play round after round after round after yes. round uh it just you know it was interesting but again it wasn't as good as we were hoping it was going to be no it was, it it was a different game and that was a, a disappointment on top of everything yeah. else so that was game five so then we followed that up with more dude no, not, not that we played Dude more. We played More Dude, which is the expansion for Dude called More Dude. And this was at this point, yes, everyone was saying, let's just put it away. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. We got to try More Dude at least once just to get it off the pile of shame. So we did More Dude. And it's, I, I don't know, it's, it's More Dude, but worse. It's Dude, but not as good. Like, Yeah, it was a weaker presence uh, a premise. Um, like it, it felt, I think there were the same number of, Mm-hmm. things or ways to say dude but it felt less it yes. felt forced it it just it didn't feel right and i think maybe if you took half of each deck and put them together for more and more dude and dude mm-hmm. maybe i yeah i think that'll work but i, I really do i again I, on its own more dude doesn't work no. it just doesn't. so so what more dude did was twist it so instead of the way dude is written it's characters saying dude and you're supposed to talk like that character what i thought was bad in more dude is they were too easy except for the cowboy how does a cowboy say dude we never did really figure that out yeah but like the robot was people going dude and the ghost was people going dude and you just knew instantly that oh they must have the ghost they must have the robot and the surfer dude was when you just said darn normal thing like i i, I was a little disappointed with that because it just it was too easy right yep. it kind of defeated the purpose whereas the first one we did kind of i think every group would do this fall into a certain pattern for saying certain ones and eventually you recognize them but i think that's part of the meta game and every time you right. throw someone new in the group that's going to get mixed up which i think is actually one of the good points of the game whereas these were just blatantly obvious what you should say no absolutely and i think the the interesting way of what would happen with uh throwing this in with the original dude is it would add a brain twist because all of a sudden you'd have to go from seeing the word dude written in a certain way and saying it to represent that way to seeing a character and having this again, say that word, but not, but say it in that character's word. And I, it's one of those things where if you got playing fast enough, it would be really easy to say, dude, dude, robot. No, I mean, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and mess up that way, I and mean, you know you could even add penalties if you. If, yeah, if it I, was gonna, happening. I think that that would actually be a bonus. I think that would uh, make the game better, to be honest. And and so that you know, again, I, I think if you mashed it together, more dude has some benefit. But but yeah, as a own, standalone, more if you're gonna pick work. up dude, if this sounds fun to you, just buy dude or yeah. buy both. Don't buy more dude. It, yeah. it is it's not gonna. It's a one trick pony that is yeah. over the first time you play it. Don't don't try and play more dude on its own. Yes. So that was more dude our sixth game of Sean Con. Now I'm going to jump over to the chat again. So we have a question from May that I think is a good one here. So a question about Sean Con. not sure if this has been asked before, but can Sean Con take place with Sean Hamilton or only with Sean from Hamilton? And I'm thinking maybe that's how we have to grow it. So next year we get Sean Hamilton. And then the year after I try to get Sean and he'll cook us um, Coney dogs. And then the year after we'll get Sean from rogues to come in and he can like give everyone free comics at Sean Con. 
And I think we just keep growing it. And then, then we'll get Sean Cox over and he can uh, teach us to play Battletech or what, Infinity or whatever new miniature games out there. And at some and point then, it goes from Sean Con to the Gathering of Sean's. Yes, there you go. And then the, like the Gathering of Reeds or uh, I think the, the other place, Rick and Morty did that one too, I think. But yes, it, it might. And then all of a sudden I'm not invited anymore because I'm not a Sean and I'm all <laughs> bummed out because someone took the thing I made and made it better. Well, you collect Sean, so I think you'll be allowed. It's whether or not D can. Uh, oh, that's it true. Is the... we, she might have to change her name. She'll be the the. the she'll use the female Sean. Uh, Sean Hamilton again. We this we did mention earlier. Sean Hamilton and Sean from Hamilton will be playing uh, Space Base together on Saturday. So we're wondering if the, the worlds might collide there. But yes, we have pictures of you guys playing years ago. You know, back in the old days where we gamed in public at game stores. Right. So yeah, after dude kind of flopped, like we we laughed, we had fun, fair enough. I wanted a fi- surefire hit for the end of the night, so I grabbed my copy of Codenames Duet. Now we had five of us, and we played Codenames Duet, because remember, it's not just for two players. Now this was your first time playing this version of Codenames, what did you think? Uh, I think it's, it's interesting, and one of the nice benefits is, while I had played Codenames with groups before, mm-hmm. uh, there's some downtime there, right? There's there's yeah. that time where, okay, they're guessing and you're sitting back giggling, but you're not really doing anything. Uh, whereas in this time, when if, you know, if the other team is guessing, you're still staring oh, yeah. at the card, trying to figure out what your next move is going to mm-hmm. be and, and, you know, what's going on. There's, there's a lot of action the whole time that game is being played. Uh, and it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it is it is really good like like it, it uh, what do you think's better code names or duet uh i again if i think for a big enough group uh you'd want to switch i probably want to go back to code names yeah. uh again just space and and, and various mm-hmm. things but for i i'd say anywhere up to at least eight people duet absolutely hands down yeah. <laughs> no i agree completely that was Codenames Duet, the last day of game one of Sean Khan and our seventh game overall. Now, again, seven different game. We have had multiple plays of something. We actually played two rounds of Codenames Duet, for example. Dude was once each. Next up is Draconis Invasion. This ended up being deck building day. Somehow Saturday became deck building day. Now, I know Sean loves deck building games, and I expected to play some, but I wasn't expecting so many in a row. The one we started off with is Draconis Invasion, which we're going to keep pretty short here because this is the game we will be reviewing in detail later. Yeah, I mean, I sat down and uh, started going through the book. You were upstairs sharing some deals or something. So I sat down and read the manual, read the uh, read the instructions and, and sorted the box to get out so that we could play it at some point. Uh, and it was just easy to jump right in there. Uh, I would say, you know, just the 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 super off the top two player tends to have some a, a couple of little issues uh but once you hit the three player mark and it plays from one to six uh yep. once you're at three players it was just a good game it was yep. just it it was enjoyable period so just for those of you who haven't heard the review yet and won't be able to stick around for the full thing because you say watching this on youtube uh this is a deck building game very much based on dominion with a medieval fantasy theme where you are collecting action cards and defenders trying to defeat invaders who are coming in it has a lot of the tropes of dominion but does do some interesting things like having to pay for your heroes once you've drafted them and a really unique terror mechanic that speeds up the game and fills your deck with crap it is definitely a different take uh, compared to most fantasy deck builders yeah the the big theme behind it is you are behind you are losing you are you know, th- th- there is an insurmountable set of foes coming to attack your art, your castle, your keep, your city, your your realm. Um, you know, you aren't expected to win. The best you can do is hope to hold them off for this round. Yep. And that was game eight of Sean Khan, Draconis Invasion. All right. So while playing Draconis, I spent a large part of that game comparing it to Minion especially when some of the cards have the exact same abilities with different names. Like there is a lot of crossover here. And then what I totally missed up until playing this, that Sean had never played Dominion. So we had to fix that. So I went and grabbed my box of Dominion and we played two rounds. Um, 
we played with both with Tiana. Yeah, we played both games with Tiana because I'm like, wow, we talk about Dominion all the time and how it's the root and Sean's in the deck building. How has he not played Dominion? So I had to fix that. So we usurped everything else on the Sean Must playlist to throw in a game of Dominion there. And I mean, it's a classic. It, it is, you know, it is where deck building comes from. Uh, it shows its age. Um, you know, a, a lot of games have taken it and moved on, but that doesn't mean it's not still a good game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, again, you know, some people, you know, are used to more and are going to want more from a game than Dominion. But uh, when they do finally drop the app, I will be buying it because I still enjoy it as a deck builder. Yeah, it's just, it feels so pure. I actually enjoyed these plays. I was thinking of getting rid of Dominion until I played this, and I'm like, ah, oh, Dominion just... It's, it's just pure. There's there's nothing clogging it up. There's nothing making it messy. The rules are all perfectly clear. And you get that combo where you do 80 things in a row and then still get to buy nothing because you only got up to seven coins. Like there was a lot more there to like than I thought. Though I know I'll get sick of it quick and I'll be like, no, give me something where I can attack bad guys or build spaceships or move up on a track. I need more than this or put trains out on the track. So that was Dominion, the original deck builder for Sean Con Game 9. Now, once I realized Sean hadn't played Dominion, I'm like, oh, yeah, wait, wait. You've at least played Tyrants of the Underdark, right? Like, that's like my favorite deck builder. Oh, no, Core Worlds? Oh, I, I still can't decide. Core Worlds and Tyrants are close, and I know Sean played Core Worlds. I had no clue that Sean had somehow missed on this, on, on, on Tyrants. Like, I actually thought, I, like, I swear I can remember playing it at the CG realm and what games were behind you. And I don't know who I did play with at the time, but I, I swear I remember teaching him and I was totally wrong. So of course, again, I had to usurp the Sean playlist and go, no, no, you got to play Tyrants of the Underdark. So it, it's a, it's a, it's a good game. And I, I have to say there are certain Dungeons and Dragons board games, which I have been rather harsh on for <laughs> having painfully weak premises and mm -hmm. painted on themes that make it not a DD board game. This is not that. This is the Underdark. Um, this this has, has all the intrigue and backstabbing and spying and dirty pool you'd expect from Drow uh, in a deck builder uh, mm -hmm. with area control. Uh, don't ever learn it with people who are lovers of the game and vastly more experienced at it and have a level of game and deck knowledge that you as a new player can't hope to reach. Yeah, so my lesson learned is only introduce Tyrants of the Underdark to two new players at once, not just one, I guess, with Deanna and I. Deanna had us, though. Like, she managed to get some early um, promote cards, and then after that had cards to clear the market and just made sure neither of us ever got another promote card. I think we each ended up with one. I think I promoted one thing the entire game. Yeah, And promotion can be a huge part of that game. I... But somehow she managed to do that and still take over the board. So I was impressed by that. I'm like, usually you kind of go one way or the other. You, you focus on one part of the game and she managed to pull off two of them all at once. So yeah, Deanna kind of kicked our butts and yes, we both did pretty well compared to Sean, but yeah, we have played the game a lot and we like it. I've tried every possible deck combination. Well, I wouldn't say I've mastered the game, but I can look over at the market and be like, yeah, I know what all those are. I know which one I want, which is yeah, a huge and, and see again, I'm not having any idea what any of these cards were or meant, uh, put me at a disadvantage, uh, significantly, but again, it was still fun. It's a good game. Uh, it was just one of those experiences where, and again, I tend not to really care too much if I'm winning or losing, uh, and especially when D's there because D's going to win. So, <laughs> you know, second, even second or third doesn't really matter to me. Uh, but I could definitely see how uh, someone who did was more interested in winning or losing mm -hmm. would definitely uh, walk away from that with a bad taste in their mouth because it was a trouncing. So that was game 10, Tyrants of the Underdark. We're way off track from what we wanted to play, so we need to get back on track. And leads us to our final game, Sean Con, which was getting Sean to be able to try the ABDW expansion, Alien B movie, Dinosaur Western expansion for Unfair. This time, uh, this was actually we decided. Have we played before? This was our first time using ABDW. 
Uh, no, you played oh. once before with the I dinosaurs. I played once before. That's right. That's right. I hadn't tried these two decks. That's what it is. This is my first time with these two of these decks, which was Alien and B-Movie. And it just, t- like, the three of us are like, well, what goes with Aliens and B-Movies? Well, robots, obviously. You got to have, like, Aliens versus robots. And I got to say, I don't know. I didn't really love that combo. Yeah, it was it was interesting. Um, despite uh, the randomness of the game, taking a hunk out of my score, uh, I still enjoyed it. Because, again, that's part of what you get when you sit down with Mm -hmm. Unfair. Uh, If you hate randomness, don't play Unfair. Um, There is going to be an aspect of randomness that no matter how much you plan for and, you know, try to account for, some things can still happen. Yes. Yeah, he got hit bad by the last two events in the game. The last two Unfair events both hit a mark. Um. So part of that is I'm thinking there's one particular blueprint there you should just never touch. No, I, see? it should say impossible on it. After after using the alien deck now three times, I'm honestly thinking I'm like there's just too many random things that can happen. Like in our last play, which I shall be talking about later, an event that goes everyone gets alien prestige, and then you're like, see, I I I just actually disagree on that that uh, because I did score that full uh, thing, and I even know how if I got it again what I would do to avoid what that person, uh, how that person got, uh, got, you know, messed up. Right. So I, again, it's, there are a bunch of different strategies. And again, we've said this before with unfair system mastery yeah. helps because you don't, if you don't know what to be prepared for, you won't be prepared for it. Uh, and you know, there is the chance that luck may hurt you anyway, but mm-hmm. at least if you know the decks, you've got a better idea of what to match up with what and what to use to try and avoid. Oh, well, if they're using that, then they're, this is going to be in the deck. So I need to watch out for this, this, and that yeah. um, just goes a long way. Uh, and I think now having played with the alien deck, uh, I've got a better idea of a couple of strategies to use when that deck's in there. That was bad. I forgot to mute my phone. We're just all over the place. So ever since our third anniversary episode, we're just like, <laughs> nah, Sean can't get the stream started. I've got no audio. <laughs> so if you are interested in Unfair, check out our review from last week's episode. We really go into detail. No, you won't have the aliens or the B-movies, but we really talk a lot about um, the mitigation. The the A big part of the game is disaster mitigation, either preventing it, having cards to stop it, or contingencies, or just expecting it to happen, like, like planning your strategy, going, there's a good chance I won't be able to get this blueprint, so I better grab some extra of this just in case, right? That is a huge part of the game, which is, a, is a, an aspect that I grew to love and did not enjoy at first. And that was the last game of the inaugural Sean Con, unfair with the first expansion. Now, while we had hoped to get in at least one game on Sunday, it just didn't work. Uh, We had a brunch episode to record, and unfortunately, Sean's grandfather, who, if you remember, just celebrated his 100th birthday, had broken his hip. And Sean, rightfully so, wanted to stop by and see him before heading home and convince him to stop doing guard work. Yeah, he's he's, he's not ready to give up yet, still living on his own uh, in his own home. So Hashtag life goals. Won't be (laughs) us at this rate, but hey, you can try. So that's it for our coverage of the first ever Sean Con. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. Hello, and welcome to our detailed look at Draconis Invasion, a fantasy deck building game with some interesting new twists. Thank you, Jeff Lai and Keggy Games for sending us a copy of this game to check out. Now, Draconis Invasion was designed by Jeff Lai and features some striking artwork from a number of people. Juan Pablo Fernandez, Vuk Kostic, Manthos Lapis, Lagosh Pedrich, and Unreal Smoker. It was published in 2016, I think it's K-E-J-I, because they always put it in capitals, maybe it's Kedji, after a rather successful Kickstarter. Now, this non-collectible card game plays one to six players, with games taking up to an hour and a half but much less with fewer players. Now, this has a MSRP of $75 Canadian. I'm pretty sure it's a Canadian company. I could not find a U.S. price. It's it's around there somewhere, but $75 Canadian. 
Now, in Dracotis Invasion, you're a noble hero charged by your king to defend the kingdom from the invasion of the Draconis, a monstrous horde. You start with a handful of Imperial Guard and some gold, which you'll use to buy action cards and recruit more heroic defenders. These defenders will let you defeat invading troops, but only as long as you can afford to pay them. Earn additional glory for completing contracts for the king, which require you to defeat specific foes. And do all of this as terror builds, rushing the game to its end. Can one of you defeat enough of the Draconis invaders to save the realm, or will you all be forced to retreat? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm not sure if calling them heroic defenders is all that appropriate. I mean, they're mercenary defenders. Yeah. <laughs> True now, enough, I was going with a term in the rule book. <laughs> now, for a look at various cards, which come in three different sizes and other components for this game, I welcome you to check out our Draconis Invasion unboxing video on YouTube. All right, first thing I want to talk about in regards to component quality here is the box the game comes in. So the box for this features a standard, like fairly deep rectangular box with a trough in the middle that's obviously like glued in that I found a little confusing because none of the three sections that are made by this are wide enough to fit the square cards that come in the game. Also, the graphics on the box are warped over the edges, wrapped, sorry, wrapped over the edges, and that causes cards at the end of the row to get cut there. And while having room for expansions is great, it's been many years since this game's released and it has one expansion. There is a lot of air in this box. And it also looks like the box grew at some point. Maybe it was a Kickstarter scratch hole or something because the instructions look like something that would go in a standard deck box. It just seems silly at the size they are for the box that came in and made it like harder to read. Like, blow them up. Give me a bigger box. Yeah, now actually, uh, I, I did the sort for this, uh, this one and... While they did thankfully give you plenty of nice foam to hold things in place, boxes mm -hmm. of this style are just frustrating, and they don't make it easy or enjoyable to work with cards of varying sizes. I had the exact same complaints with the multiverse box for the DC deck builder. It's just not the right way to hold cards. Like, I almost wonder if they went to someone and said, give me the box of legendary games come in where the center trough is actually for the play mat you roll up to play on and not for holding cards. Like, I, I'm wondering if maybe they went with a publisher or someone, a manufacturer that had offered them that. Like, oh, we can give you this box that we also use. I don't know. It's just not great at all. Yeah. Now, getting back to the rules, uh, though, there are three copies. Ermin, Ermin? Wow. All right. There are three copies of the rules in English, German, and French. Uh, these are pretty clear and easy to read, include quite a bit of flavor text in addition to the game rules, including a whole section at the back that tells you who all the defenders are and who all the monsters are and everything else. Now, being a deck building game with a static market, the game does come with a number of layouts for you to try out with different types of cards, and they give you 10 different scenarios. And they're meant to be played in order with the final scenario, actually an 11th scenario, being to randomize the cards. So that's also available. Now, even though the rulebook is, as Mo mentioned, small, it was pretty easy to read and flip through even with my aging eyes. Now, the cards themselves are of excellent quality, linen finish. They feel good in your hands. They don't slide around. They do come in three unusual sizes. So there's your standard playing card size. Then there's a skinnier card. Then there's two different types that way. One's landscape, one's not. And then there's also perfectly square cards. Well, rounded edges, but square cards, which does make sorting the cards a little easier, but I am so glad I don't sleep my games. They also include some taller dividers, which makes the cards organizing easy enough. And as Sean mentioned, there are foam blocks to hold things in place. Yeah, so the decks were not sorted into their individual <laughs> cards when I when we first opened it. So in order for me to sit down and sort this all out so that we could build these layouts easier as we, you know, open up the book and the, the book and, and, and picked a layout to go with, every deck had to be sorted out into the different piles in order to put them away. Hey. It was really bizarre to, you know, have this great sorting mechanism and then print your cards in these groups that don't make any sense as far as I can tell. Sean has never played a legendary game. <laughs> it is it never opened a legendary game. No, what's even worse? I sorted a ton of those during the unboxing. It was worse. I sorted them by card back at least. So right. at least you like had some sorting going on. Now the cards you do 
have include action and defender cards. Those are the ones you buy and build your deck with. Campaign cards that are for end game scoring. Invader cards at two levels. Those are the things you're fighting. Terror cards, which clog up your deck and advance the timeline. And finally, event cards, which occur every time the terror level gets too high. So, well, as mentioned earlier, the art on these cards is great. Some of the pieces are indeed poster worthy, I think. Mm -hmm. But overall, the art is dark. And by that, I don't mean theme, though they are that as well. Mm -hmm. But primarily with these blacks and browns and dark grays. And as a result, identifying the cards from their images is no. not easy. Uh, this is not magic where you're going to go, oh, yeah, look across the table and you see a piece of art and you instantly know that, oh, that's the Mesa Pegasus or, you know, Angel of whatever. Yeah, that's not going to happen in this game. Uh, there are a couple of cards that do stand out in my mind mm -hmm. as other than dark. Uh, the Sorceress was a bright card yep. and really stood out, instantly recognizable. But other than that card in particular, they're all just a blur of yeah. dark. The action cards, every action card we saw just all blended together. There was a row of cards there. I, I couldn't tell you what the pictures were. And some of them, we couldn't even figure out what the picture was. The gold digging card, we never did figure out what that art was supposed to be. Yeah, no, it was it was strange. And I mean, it, it's probably a crop of something. And if you were like, you know, if you were able to zoom out and see what the artist was picturing in its entirety, it would make perfect sense. But I, I can't yeah. quite tell what this is. <laughs> If anyone does have that game, let us know what that picture is supposed to be because yeah. we passed that around the table trying to figure that one out. Yep. Now, another thing the game does come with is a D6 die that has nice big numbers on it, which is great because you have to read things from across the table because this is used to track the terror level and everyone needs to be able to see it. Then there's the mystery item, the black cloth bag that is in there for no reason. There is nothing in this game that needs a bag. Nothing. This was confusing enough that I went online looking for a use for the bag, wondering if there was something in the original Kickstarter or some expansion or something print and play or some. No one seems to have figured out what this is for. There are multiple threads out there discussing this bag, but no answer to its existence that I ran across. So what I decided is this is the bag that we're going to throw in Adventuria for the hero tokens to randomize things because the bag that does come with Adventuria is a little tight. <laughs> That's what it's for. It's to help out another game from another publisher. I, same thing. If you know what the art is on the gold and you know what the bag's for, hit us up. Well, now that you've got a good idea of what you get with this deck building game, how about you give us an overview of play? All right, you start a game, a Draconis Invasion, by deciding what action and defender cards you want to use. Now, there is one card from each of these types that's always in play. The other five cards, though, you swap up between games. Now, as mentioned earlier, the rules include 10 different scenarios that are meant to be played in order, and then once you finish those, you unlock random market play. <clears throat> now, while initially I sort of dismissed the progression, and I'll admit it's not supported by any lore or text no. in the manual, it did mix things up nicely and change mm. things up as we went. We even found ourselves concerned when we knew that a card that we had perhaps been leaning on a little heavily wasn't going to be available yeah. in the next round. And to me, that's a good sign. They've done something right if you can become invested in the progression. Yep. Now, I did think Sean called out something that I totally missed while writing this up earlier is the fact there's no fluff, which is weird because there's lots of fluff for this game. I would have preferred a progression that told the story as well. That would have been a nice touch is some kind of story system that goes, well, the first round, you're just setting up your initial defenses against the scouts to it's a full on siege in game 10. That would have been a nice touch. Now, there are there are titles to the setups. So yeah. you can sort of guess at what where it's going at. But it, it, there's nothing, it's literally, you've got a title to work with, and that's yeah. it. Now, the market itself is created with all copies of the cards. So all six, uh, your action cards, all six defenders, you put them all into play. There's no modifying that for player count, and there's no game end if any of these run out, like some other deck building games this is similar to. Now, the rest of the cards are all just shuffled, placed near the board. Um, you're going to flip some face up, like you're going to put three of each level of invader up and three campaign 
cards face up. Your event deck, you're going to build based on the number of players. Those are just put on top of a retreat card. So you don't get to look at these. You just shuffle them up, put the set number on the retreat card. And then players collect their starting decks, which as usual in these games is kind of garbage. You get seven wealth cards worth 10 gold each and five Imperial guards, which can attack for five damage, but thankfully work for free. An opening to uh, anyone who's played almost any deck builder based off Dominion should be familiar with. All right, start player is determined by the roll of the threat die, and then that player rolls it again to set the starting threat level at the beginning of the game. Now, this number is referenced on this starting threat card, which gives all players some cards to start with. Um, based on what we saw, I don't think we did see every number, you tend to get at least one threat card and then some starting gold. And the gold could be like the really good gold because the gold's the, like it goes wealth, then something, then fortune. You might wealth, start with wealth, fortune. treasure, and fortune. Yeah, wealth, treasure, and fortune. Like two times in our games, we started with fortune, which was huge. Uh, both of these just go in your discard pile, though. So you're not going to get them in your starting hands or your beginning couple rounds. Yeah. Now, interestingly, this reference card for the starting threat is just the starting threat. It's yeah. put away after you, you make that one roll at the very beginning before the game starts. Yeah, that one confused me because I thought when I'd seen a Watch It Played video that I'd watched for this, that it was something that was going to keep happening, that as the threat escalated, you'd just keep getting stuff. And I'm glad it's not. Having now played the game, that would be horrible. You'd be getting a threat every flipping time the die spun up and it wouldn't work. So I get it. But yeah, it's interesting. And what I do like is it, it makes it so the beginning of the games do change up. Like there are only six different options, but still six different options with your different cards and everything does add another layer of replayability. Now, each round of Draconis Invasion uses this, I, I want to say patented because they should in a way, A, B, C, D, E, F system. So A to F system, which I thought was really brilliant. On a turn, you may do A, then you do one of B, C, D, or E, and then you may do F. And each of these represent a different action. Here's a quick summary of those. So A, action. Play an action card from your hand, do what it says. Note, some action cards will give you additional actions. This will be familiar to anyone who's played Dominion. B, buy. Buy a card from the market. Play gold cards. Spend the income earned to buy one card from the market, either an action or a defender. Again, some action cards will give you additional buys. You give another flashback to Dominion. Next is campaign. Draw, draft two campaign cards. These can either come from the face-up cards or drawn from the top of your deck. These are kept secret. They're in-game scoring. D, defeat. Attempt to defeat an invader. Play a number of defender cards from your hand, as well as enough gold to pay them, and then collect an invader whose health is equal to or less than your total attack value of the paid defender cards. Reveal a new invader and do what it says in the card, which will involve you getting a terror card somewhere, whether in your deck or on the top of your deck or in the discard. E is eliminate. Eliminate a card from your hand. This lets you prune your deck by returning a card to the market. Now, those are your A, a B, A, you had, you had an option. B, C, D, and E are a choice. You have to do one of those. Then you have F, follow. At the end of your turn, or sorry, forward. I wrote follow, it's forward. At the end of your turn, you can forward one gold card from your hand, which could be of all, any of the three levels, and place it face down on top of your deck. Honestly, the simplicity of this system is subtle, but powerful. One problem with many deck builders is the turn action order, trying to remember what you can and can't do and in what order you can do it by using a, a memnonic already known by everyone in the three languages you're printing your game for. Mm -hmm. You've just eliminated the problem of trying to remember that order uh, just yep. straight off the bat. <laughs> if we're French, English and, and German we're, are all using the same alphabet. So you've learned if you're able to play this game, A, B, C, D, E, F. Yeah, I love it. A, B, C, D, or E, then F. I love it. it. It's just really good. It was great for teaching. Like, we played a bunch of games, and Deanna joined us, and I'm like, look, just grab this card. This is what you do. It's like, yep, that makes sense. Now, along with that general gameplay flow, every time you have to discard a terror card from your hand, that's important, you advance the threat die one level. When it hits a six, which is this, like, screaming skull pitcher, an event card is drawn, but not played right away. It's handed to the next player. Now, if the die gets additional threat, it keeps rolling over. So it goes from six back to one and it can keep rolling. And multiple events can trigger in one turn if enough carrier cards are discarded by one player. And it's important that it's at the start of the next player's turn that they read out the event cards that 
uh, were you know earned, <laughs> mm-hmm. and and that's when it takes place. You still finish your turn and redraw before the effects of terror hit you yes. or or anyone. Now, after advancing the threat die, play passes to the next player. This continues until one player has defeated a set number of invaders, determined by the player count, or the retreat card is revealed at the bottom of the event deck. Note that last event doesn't happen. As soon as you can see that card, it's over. At this point, players add up all their glory. Uh, The monsters have a glory value on them. You're going to add any bonus glory for completed campaigns. One of the things to note is the only thing worth victory points in this is defeating the invaders. There's no, like, none of the cards you're buying to fill your deck are worth points which is something in many modern deck building games do. Player with the most glory wins the game. And while mechanically you're going to have points, one of the two players will win from a story point. It's worth considering that it's a loss against the game if that retreat card emerged and you didn't finish kill the, the correct number of uh, enemies to end the game in that manner. What's odd is it's not just a game loss, no one wins. It's odd that it's still, like, to be honest, it's just a timing mechanism. To me, that removes the theme from the game. By having it, like, you all lost, all your efforts were for nothing. I think I think it would have been actually better if that retreat card made it a everyone loses to make the game have more of that competitive nature. Now, due to this being a card-based deck-building game, of course, there are a number of cards that may break the rules. I shouldn't say may, they all do. All the cards, basically, all the action cards in particular, break the rules in some way, uh, providing additional actions, uh, additional uses of the ADF system, or stuff that's completely apart from the ADF system. They include all the stuff you'd expect in a deck builder, such as upgrading cards to better ones, drawing more cards from your deck, searching your deck for specific cards, swapping out the invaders that are attacking, and so on. Well, now that we know how to play, let's move on to our thoughts about Draconis Invasion. All right, I gotta admit, when I first sat down to learn this game, I wasn't expecting much. And that trepidation got worse once I started actually reading some of the cards that Sean was putting out. So Sean taught this game. So thumbs up. Thanks for that. Um, Once I started to see some of the cards, I'm like, wow, I'm getting a lot of flashbacks to Dominion. And I don't necessarily love Dominion. It feels a little dated to me. So like like some of these action cards are word for word from Dominion. They just changed the name. They do all the things like get an extra action and draw two cards or discard X cards from your hand and draw this many new ones from your deck. Like those are cards that are right from both games. And what I was pleased to find is once we start playing, yes, this is still an aspect of the game. Yes. It definitely shows its roots. There's enough other stuff going on that I didn't feel like I was playing dominion with add-ons instead playing a, a bigger game. And to be honest, it's turned into an advantage because it made the game feel familiar. So I didn't have to worry about those base mechanics. I could focus on the new stuff. Yeah, and and even if you haven't played Dominion, it's far from unapproachable. While I wouldn't consider this a gateway deck builder per se, it's certainly not wildly complex and anyone with any number number of uh, other deck builders under their belt should pick it up really quickly. Now, a big part of that other stuff that isn't in Dominion is the way you have to pay for your Defender cards to use them. This is something I've never seen before. I've played a lot of deck builders, a lot of fantasy deck builders, and I've never seen this particular mechanic because not only do you have to buy the card from the market and get it in your deck, and then it's got to come up. When it does come up, you've got to pay for it to use it. And this took the longest time to get used to. Like, I, I even by, I think by game five, I was starting to finally figure out how much money i needed my deck to make this work and when it doesn't it can be extremely frustrated when your defenders just keep coming up but you never have enough money or when you have enough money you never have a defender yeah while highly thematic it is intentionally punishing Mm -hmm. managing resources to buy is straightforward enough but then you have to work those same engines and combos that bought you the cards to use the card Mm -hmm. that you already bought This game is designed to feel like an uphill battle. You're losing. You're being attacked by an unimaginably vast enemy and hope is in short supply as the crushing fear of the encroaching waves of enemies build up in you, leaving you crippled. Now, while it achieves this very well at times, Mm -hmm. it might be argued that it achieves it a bit too well sometimes. 
Now, the one thing I did appreciate in this game, I already mentioned it basically, is the ABCDEF system. Uh, this worked really well, made teaching new players the game very easy. Uh, the step names actually managed to be thematic and fit the letter pattern. So I'm like, whoever was able to come up with those, good job. Um, I also like the fact that calling a card from your deck is an action you can just take. Like that's just one of your options is ditch a card. I love that. You, you don't need some special card or you don't need the right thing to come up. I... Yeah, that is great. I'd love to see that more deck builders. The other thing I like, and I have seen this in other games, is the ability to put something on the top of my deck and save it for next turn is something else I appreciate. And Draconis does this with the, the wealth cards, which, again, make sure you have that money to pay for your guys or to buy the stuff. Yeah, mechanically, this game is really quite straightforward. If you try, take the time to ensure what the cards and rules actually say, because their wording is very specific, it turns yes. out. Uh, you probably won't be making any horrible errors. You do occasionally have to take the time, though, and really read and, and double read things sometimes to uh, to ensure that you are playing correctly. So next, I want to talk a bit about the most controversial part of this game, at least based on what we've seen from other reviewers, and that is the entire terror and event system. Now, this is something else I've not seen before in a deck building game. Well, I have played many games with punitive cards, stuff that like, even the original Dominion, uh, the, the cards that score your points clog up your deck, right? And that's, that's a pretty standard thing. And while terror cards do clog up your deck, they do more than that. Because having a lot of terror in your deck not only means you're not going to draw as good a hand, right? You're going to have a harder time getting cards you can use together. It also advances the game towards the end, which causes events and every event in the game causes people to get more terrors, so it just compounds. Now, this also has an added effect that due to the way terror works, you don't want to thin your deck. There is almost no way to remove the, the punitive cards, which is just feels weird because almost every other deck builder I've ever played is all about making the most efficient thin deck that you can cycle through. And the goal of most of them is to be able to draw your entire hand every turn. You don't want to do that in this game. That means you've drawn every terror card you have every turn. Now, that is one issue of it, and it is so hard to eliminate terror. There is one way in the entire game, and it's I think it was an event, that lets you eliminate a card randomly from your hand. That's not even something that's going to happen every game. And you definitely can't base a strategy around that. Yeah. And in fact, in all the games we played, only once was a, any terror card ever eliminated from a hand. Yes. Now, there are some ways to skip drawing mm -hmm. them into your hand, which means you do, if you don't draw them into your hand, you can't discard them from your hand. Uh, which helps hold back the onrushing tide of despair, but that's a stopgap measure at best. Yeah, and there's the there's only a couple action cards that were, or character cards that will even allow you to do that. So it's not even like they'll be there in every game. Now, as for the events themselves, I have some mixed thoughts on these. Like my first issue is despite giving you a large deck of adventure cards, 16 total, there's only four different types. So there's four copies of four of the same card. And that just made events feel repetitive and boring. Like by game two, maybe by game three, I'm like, oh, that again, that again. And it got to the point where I didn't even have to hear the card. I just asked, does it go on my deck or does it go in my discard? Because that was the end result of most of these. Or there was one where you discarded cards. But like terror, you'd say terror on, terror in the discard, terror just like we stopped reading them. It didn't matter. The second problem is that every single one of these events is designed to punish the leader. They're a catch-up mechanic. Now, besides lacking variety, because every single one just attacks a leader, you don't get any moving around, it encourages players to hold back and not take the lead and try and be in second place and or worse than second place. And it dissuades you from taking the big monsters to attacking the gold-backed invader cards because those are the tiebreakers. So if two people have the same amount of things they've killed, whoever killed the most gold wins the tie. And that just has players not doing it. And both of these end up making the game longer. Like people just hold back while they could be doing things. And while I think these are very valid player responses, like, like the, the psychology of this backing off makes sense to me it is completely against the theme of the game. And I honestly think against the design intention as well. Yeah, indeed. This would be my number one complaint of the game. These need variety. And even if they are only ever going to attack uh, the kill leader, a better spread of, 
things of, of outcomes could reduce the need mm -hmm. for players to avoid killing things. If you knew it might not be as soul crushing and punishing a result <laughs> when it came up, then you might just take more chances and do more. Yeah, it also stops players after they played a few rounds. It does take a bit to realize this meta to just rush out and kill the cheapest things as quick as possible. Because if you do that, your deck gets filled with terror before you put much else in it. And it just constantly you get terrible hands and you can do nothing. So like I, I said, mixed feelings, because in a way, I, I like the fact there's a catch up mechanic. If someone does try to rush to kill all the things, they're going to get penalized for it. And I think that fits. I really hate the turtling that happens. The I'm just going to wait up and sit back and just kind of play through and try not to do anything because I don't want the terror to happen. It just totally breaks the immersion in the theme. Now, this lack of variety in event cards is repeated in other areas of the game as well. There's only four different invaders in the low level. Like there's a nice deck, but again, it's it's four of four. There's 16 cards or something like that. And there are only four different ones, which I didn't even notice when playing. It was something when I was when I was getting ready for the review, I went through the deck. Campaign cards, I would have assumed there was at least one campaign card for every monster type. There's not only a small subset of the monster types on the campaign cards. And then there are way more campaign cards than you could possibly ever score, which seemed like an odd choice to me. So I don't know why they did it that way, but it seems odd to have like six copies of kill two skeletons when there's only four skeletons in the game. That just seemed like an odd design choice to me. So this didn't bother me as much. And I think it's designed uh, particularly for the, to, to work for the six player game. So in a six player game, everyone can be trying to kill two skeletons but Even not everyone is going to be able to score it. Yeah, so you're going to end up with you're going to end up with campaigns that go unused in the large player games. Now they could have gone through and and you know in a smaller player game sort the deck, move. but that would have been a pain to do, and it doesn't really hurt the game for them to be there. Yes, it was it was yeah. odd, but it didn't actually hurt me uh, hurt it much. And while I, I did know there was an expansion, and I don't think games should make you need to get an expansion. Playing through this game, I wanted one, not because anything was missing, but because I wanted more. I just yeah. wanted to keep going. Uh, mainly events. Like, I know they're in there. I've seen the expansion, but like, <laughs> the, the, there is, I, I did want more variety. Now, I also do feel the need to point out the rules aren't the most clear at times. Um, some of the card abilities can be a bit ambiguous. Now, there is an FAQ section of the rule book, which just points you online. That I don't like. I would like, like, you know, if you're going to reprint your rule book, put some of the FAQ in there at least. Still give me a link online. Uh, for a couple of the cards, we went to the FAQ online and they weren't addressed at all. Now, the rule book does include a rule summary, uh, like a, a summary of all the card abilities. But this is odd. All they did was repeat the text on the cards. So if you don't understand the text of the cards, you're like, oh, look it up in the book for the... No, that's the exact same text, which is just weird. Usually when they put the, the rules in the book, there's like a more detailed description of how a card works, maybe step by step through this, then this, then this. Um, there were answers for everything. It just some of them could be interpreted multiple ways. So basically what we did is we played the card, we handed it around. What do you think it says? What do you think it says? What do you think it says? Came to an agreement and just stuck with it for all our games. Now, I will say what was interesting is we played everything right according to the designer. So we, we at least saw the proper intent, though I'm still kind of surprised by the one card, the gold digging card, I did not think would let you cycle through terror. Yeah, it's, it's the one mechanic that... Uh that allows you to sort of bypass the terror. Um, and, and I have to say this, the card summary in the rule book is useless. Yeah. What, why? Why are you just rewriting the text in an even smaller form? Because again, this is a smaller rule book. Uh, so you've, you've taken the, the card text and shrunken it down even smaller to, uh, to write it out there. <laughs> it's, yeah. I, I don't, don't get that. So overall, this game has left me conflicted. Like, on one hand, this game's got its flaws. But then it's got some neat stuff, too. Uh, like, the action system, like, uh, not the A through F, like, the action cards and playing action cards is kind of boring. Like, it just, I, it's Dominion. So you got Dominion with this other stuff. But then I love the whole do an A, then do a B, C, D, or E, then do an F. I, like, I love that. So that was a great system. And I like the fact that, like, a buy is a different action than an attack. Um, the fact you have to pay for your defenders is really interesting. It, it is the most unique part of this game. 
and fits really well thematically. Like, yes, you hire your mercenaries, you have to pay for them to use them. And no, the, the prices aren't the same, right? You might hire them for 60, well, it only takes 40 to use them, right? There's, there's some of that play going on. But more often than not, it just led to frustration. Like, so frustrating. And while the game has some big win moments where you pulled off the thing and did the impressive thing, they're so far apart that I don't even know if it makes up for those moments of frustration. On the other hand, the terror event thing worked. I thought it was neat, but there's just not enough variety, which is the same problem I personally found with the invasion and campaign deck. I'm like, I'm fighting the same monsters over and over again. It's no longer, I'm like, yes, I have 15, I kill a succubus. Oh, I have 10, I kill skeletons. Oh, I got up to 30, I kill this. And it just kind of became like almost wrote like what you did when you get to certain attack levels. The thing is, with all these potential flaws and bumps and things that we didn't love it ended up being really fun and well that's really important thing right like the best games in your collection are the ones that hit your table and the ones that hit the table tend to be the ones that are most fun like we broke out this game for the first time this was early in the morning well not that early we slept in a bit but early enough in the morning <laughs> after our first coffee and we planned on like let's play it a couple times to get a feel for it and I wasn't planning on reviewing this for a couple of weeks at least, right? Playing a couple of time, more times. But we ended up spending the entire afternoon playing. Playing and enjoying and exploring Draconis Invasion. Like, honestly, the only reason we stopped is because Sean was in town. And we were like, we need to get these other games played for the pile of obligation. We need to play Unfair. That's important. Uh, so we probably could have kept going. And Deanna actually was like, no, no, let's play some more. I'm like, but we played five times already. Like, like I, 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 I don't know. I don't, there's something about this game that just kept drawing us back for more. Now I will say that the rules have some variants mm -hmm. solo two player and their teams mode each have slight variations for setup and finishing rules. While three to six players is all by the book. I personally found that when D joined us uh, after our first couple of games and we started playing three player, the game felt more solid than it mm -hmm. did at two. I, I probably would have stopped playing significantly sooner if we'd kept playing only with two players. Yeah. Uh, for one thing, the terror mechanic uh, is exceedingly punishing at two player. Uh, and it felt just, it just felt so much more oppressive at that count. Yeah. And the uh, the the lack of variation really kind of mm -hmm. stood out at two players. A good example of that is every single game two player we lost. Every single game we got to the retreat card. None of our three player games that happened. Someone won for getting it, defeating enough enemies every time. So I think that just shows how much more punishing the two player is compared to the other levels. Yeah. So. Should you pick this game up, right? Should you buy Draconis Invasion if you can find a copy of it? Um, if you enjoy deck building games, check it out. Like, like I'd strongly consider say you should check this out. Maybe not or so buy it, find a demo, find a way to play, go to a local game event, um, find a way to try the game out. Well, a lot of the game is stuff you've probably seen before. Um, Draconis Invasion adds some new elements that put quite the twist on things. While the game's not perfect, there is quite a lot of fun despite its flaws. Now I suggest, I don't even know what word just came up most. I suggest this game even more for fans who like fantasy beat up the monster style deck builders, right? So not just Dominion fans and people who like the uh, eminent domain. Like these are the games where you're collecting a team and then you're going to beat up a bad guy. And this doesn't just mean not even just deck builders, right? Valeria card kingdoms would fall into this where you're, you're collecting all your resources to go explore the dungeon to kill the bad guy. If you're into that, you might just want to pick this up straight up. I really think there's a lot to dig here, especially if you're into the theme of having to hire your mercenaries and pay for them. There's something about this game that reminds me of like old school role playing. I have a feeling that that like Purists and Gronyards and, and Dungeon Crawl fans will like that aspect of having to hire your defenders and play them during play. Now, if you're looking for a light, fun romp, this <laughs> isn't your game. It's hard. And while I'm sure like anything, you'll pick up tricks and combos to help the more you play and, and become more skilled at it, it's hard enough that if you're not willing to give it a few plays and try things, it could leave you with a bad taste in your mouth after a first yeah. play. 
Now, if you aren't a fan of deck building games, this isn't one of those games that's going to sell you on deck building or change your mind. I really don't think so. At its heart, it is a purely, pretty pure static market deck builder, right? That's one where the cards don't change every round. You set them at the beginning of the game. And it's got that, that, that core mechanic, the roots that the other stuff's built on. I don't think the other stuff is going to be enough if you don't like those roots. Now, personally... I am really got, glad I got to try this one out. I am so glad that I reached out and was like, yeah, yeah, I'll check this game out. It sounds cool. My my partner loves loves deck builders. So yeah, a new fantasy deck builder, I'll check it out. I am so glad I did because now I have a copy of this game. I am really looking forward to exploring Draconis Invasion Wraith. Wrath. I always want to say Wraith. Draconis Invasion Wrath. That is the expansion which features 12 scenarios that you play in order that each unlock a new sealed pack of cards with story, which is part of what I thought was missing in the progression here. Now, some of this I know are more invaders and new events. So that may just take care of a couple of the problems I found with the base game. Well, that's it for our look at Draconis Invasion, the deck building game. I invite you to read more about this game in the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to our preview of Code Monkey Going Bananas, a coding game for kids that will be launching on Kickstarter later this year. Thank you to Taito Games for sending us a prototype copy of this game to check out. Note no other compensation was provided for this preview. Code Monkey Going Bananas was designed by Sharon Katz and will be coming to Kickstarter later this year in 2021. If funded successfully, it will be published by Taito Games. Now, this game is from the popular kids coding website, CodeMonkey.com, and is designed for two to four players, age seven or up, with games taking anywhere from 15 minutes to, unfortunately, over an hour, despite the box claiming a 20-minute playtime. Now, at this time, I wasn't able to find what price point the finished game will be at or where the Kickstarter will be starting at, so I do apologize for that. Now, despite only being a preview, they have certainly put some effort into this yes. product already. Now, in Code Monkey Going Bananas, you start by building a jungle made out of hex tiles with die pips in each hex. Six numbered trees, each with some bananas tokens on them, are added to the jungle, and players place their monkeys on a randomly rolled starting hex. Simultaneously, players will roll dice and use those along with action tiles to program their monkey's moves, with the goal being to collect the most bananas. Optional play modes include traps, gaining more actions, and they take that magic card system. While we don't normally do unboxing videos for prototype games, we did record one for this game because as I mentioned, it was well produced mm -hmm. and we didn't realize it was a prototype when it showed yes. up. If you're interested in seeing the components in this prototype, check out Code Monkeys Going Bananas prototype unboxing video on YouTube. Yeah, one of the things that confuses me, and it was my first hint, was there was no box back. And I'm like, who's going to buy this without a box back? Yeah, it's because it's a prototype. Now, I have been in contact with the designers and publishers over this game, and I do know there is going to be at least one thing that will be improved, but they do expect the quality to be about the same as what's in this box. Now, the thing that's going to be improved is the method the monkey's tails attach. Now, this is actually a result of me sharing my video with them because my copy came with a monkey with a broken tail, which was very easy to fix with glue, but they actually now have redesigned the monkey, so that shouldn't be a problem going into the future. Now, due to this being a prototype, I don't want to say too much about the component quality, just because there's a chance it may change. Now, I will say, as it stands, this game looks amazing on the table with wooden monkeys and these surprisingly sturdy wooden trees. Now, the magic card magnet thing is a little odd, but I honestly can't think of a different way they could have pulled off that same mechanic, so I guess that works. Indeed, and due to the size of the magnets they're using, they completely avoid the swallowing hazard that so many magnetic game pieces yes. suffer from. Now, that we have some idea of what you get in the game, well, at least in the prototype, how about you give us an overview of play? All right, so the goal of Code Monkeys Going Bananas is to be the monkey with the most bananas once there's no more bananas on the tree. You start every game by building the jungle, in turn, players place jungle tiles so that each tile only connects by one hex to the other tiles. Banana trees are placed in the empty spaces created so that each tree touches at least three hexes. I mean, 
if you're going to have a game with monkeys and bananas, how can most bananas not be the end scoring? Yeah, I'm not sure what else you'd do. Now, Code Monkey Going Bananas includes a number of different levels of play, each adding something new to the game. And I think this will make the most sense. I, I was I was debating whether just give you all of it. Here's all the things. But I think it'll actually make more sense if I just start with the basic game and then list all the potential add-ons afterwards. So in a basic game, all players get a programming board, two dice, and two action tokens. The tokens are swing and down. Each round, players roll their dice and then program up to three moves using these dice and those tokens. When everyone's done, players take their programmed actions with everyone completing the first action, then everyone doing their second action, and finally everyone doing their third. So, a robo rally in the jungle, really. Yeah, though much simpler. Your programming here is much easier than anything seen in robo rally. Now, the various actions that can happen are moving a monkey. You put a die on a programming spot. When that spot activates, when it's your turn in that phase, you must move your monkey as far as possible up to the number on the die. If you play a five, you need to move five unless you can't, unless it's physically impossible. Note, you can't pass other monkeys or move through a spot with a tree. You have to go along the path. Note, there is the swing action for getting past those trees. Now, the most complicated part of the rule that takes a bit to remember when you first start playing is if after the moving, you end in a hex where the number on the hex added to the number on the die you used adds up to seven, you get to climb up the tree, which is called a seven nana. So... Is there, am I missing something? Is seven Nana supposed to be a reference to something? Do they indicate in the game what that no. might be? I, I have no idea what seven Nana means. All I will say is this stuck in my kids' heads. Like that wasn't a word they forgot. Every time they did it, they would go one, two, three, four, seven Nana. Like, like it definitely stuck out. I could not find any reason for something to be called seven Nana. No clue. Okay. Uh, there is a Japanese steakhouse called Seven Nana. Uh, maybe. <laughs> so I this is a game that has that anything is, to do with it. Yeah, like, like Code Monkeys is a North American company. It's I don't, I don't think it's a translation issue in this case. So swing is the next possible action. This allows you to move through the trees. Um, basically, it lets you move onto a tree and th through it to a spot. So you don't actually collect anything. You're not climbing up top. And what they say is you're swinging from the branches below the tree. So it's through a tree to another spot. Now you can do this two ways. You can just put a swing, program swing, and then you do that one move. Or you can swing as part of movement. So you put your die down with the swing token under it. Now when you do that, the tree spot doesn't count cost any movement. So it's a good way to get around the board quickly or to dodge over spots like where monkeys could be standing in the way. Next section is down. When you're in a tree, you got to get down. When you come down from a tree, that's actually when you collect the banana tokens, if there are any present. Note, you can't collect a banana from the same tree twice in a row. Unfortunately, the game doesn't have any way to track where you last got one. So that's something you have to remember. Now, there are two ways to go down. There's a down tile that lets you go down in any hex adjacent to the tree you're in. Or you can spend a movement die, which moves you down to a hex with that number on it. So you need to get off the tree to get a banana from it. Um, last time I checked, bananas are really, really high up in the top of banana trees. Well, you have to climb up with your previous action, which is a seventh banana. And when you come down, you bring the banana with you. Okay. Now play continues until the last banana is taken from the last tree and the game ends immediately. So when that down action happens, it just stops. Look how many bananas everyone has. The player with the most bananas wins. Oddly, there's no tiebreaker listed in the rules whatsoever. Being a kid's game, we just went, everyone wins. Fair. Now, in addition to these basic rules, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of different modules you can add to make the game more interesting. Now, the rule book has a, a list on the last page showing like one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to seven, telling you which items to add first um, in their suggested order. And here are the various modules, possibly in that order, possibly not. The first is missions. Missions are represented by a set of numbered tokens matching the numbers on the trees, one through six. They're shuffled face down at the beginning of the game. Every player selects three and reveals them. You then put them in order next to your programming board in the order of your choosing. During the game, you're trying to complete these missions by getting bananas from the trees shown on the number, on the mission tokens. Now, at the end of the game, 
If a player has filled all three of their mission tokens, they get one extra banana. If you manage to fill them in order, you get three bananas. So one extra banana doesn't sound like a lot. How many are there to collect? All right, I'd have to do the math and I'm going to fail at this, but there are two tall trees that have three each, so that's six. And then there are four short trees with two bananas each, so that's eight. So six plus eight total bananas. 14 bananas. 14 bananas. And then bonuses. And I, I agree, one doesn't seem like a lot. Next are the rules for traps. Once a monkey collects their first banana, they unlock their trap, which is this uh, hexagonal tile that overlays on top of one of the hexes. At the end of each round, in player order, players place out their trap if it's not out or move it if it is there. Traps are placed either on a hex matching the number they were already on. So if it was on a three, you move it to another three on the map or into the hex that a player seven nanded from that turn. Now, while moving, if any monkey falls into a trap, their turn immediately ends. And here's kind of like the down action. When they climb out of the trap, they lose a banana, which randomly respawns one of the trees. Thematically, it's the trees are growing more bananas. So monkeys dropping banana peels for other monkeys to slip on and throw a banana out of their hands. I dig yep. it. That actually works. Yeah, that fits. Next is my favorite action tile of the entire game. And I honestly say unlock this as quick as you can. This is the loop. This makes it feel like more of a coding game. This gives players lots of new options of programming. The loop, when placed in the second programming spot, has you do your first spot's action again. More interestingly, if you put it in the third slot, though, when you get there, you're going to do your first, then your second action without any monkeys going in between. So you get to loop your actions. No, you can actually, There's. we'll get to it in a second, but there's a fourth spot. If you're using that, you can put the loop there and you do your first three actions over again. While monkey equals hungry, do get banana. Next is the magic card. Uh, not quite sure why they went with the name on this one. Everyone takes the magnetic card, Standy, and puts it in front of them so they can't see the front that has a tree on it with six numbers. The player on their left then uses a washer to select one of those three numbers. Now, you can't see whatever number that was, right? It's, it's, it's the other players can see it, you can't. When collecting to take a banana from the tree whose number is selected on their magic card, you don't get it. Uh, we call them magic bananas that went poof. Technically, by the rules, it's a rotten banana. So you go to get a banana. Oh, 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 you got a rotten banana. That banana now respawns on a random tree. The player on the left now selects a new tree. So it has to change every time. So I, when I saw those magnetic cards in the unboxing, I assumed they were a core component in the game not just an, an optional extra uh it's it's quite a component to just be a, something extra in the game see now i do think that these levels the goal is to get to the end and use all of them like it's not written as a now take this out and put this in it's add this add this add this add this add this so i think a full game of code monkey going bananas would use this every game Okay. Now, it's not at all what I expected. I thought it was going to be for programming. Like, I'm going to go here, hidden, and reveal it. And that's not at all what it was for. Now, next thing you can unlock is another swing action. Pretty simple. You get another swing token that can be used for programming. Trust me, that's huge. Like, being able to swing twice really makes it much easier to get around the jungle, avoid traps, and other monkeys. Another great one is three dice. When you first unlock this, you still only have three actions. So that just gives you better chance of not rolling, in, you know, two numbers you can't use. But once you unlock the fourth action, you need this third die to be able to program enough stuff, which is, of course, the last thing you can unlock as far as programming is concerned is all four actions, where you can now use the four spot on your programming board to do a fourth action each round. The last part of the game, which I will admit we did not actually try out, is to throw in the timer. Now, rules as written, the last player, so first player is always the youngest, sorry, Sean. Last player, it'd be the person to their right sets a five to seven minute timer on some device. And when it ends, a random banana is removed from a tree and removed from the game. Now I dig that because it puts a time limit on the game, but what it doesn't say is like, that's all it says. It doesn't say what to do next. And I honestly think it's supposed to repeat. Like now someone's supposed to set another timer and then another banana will disappear. It doesn't say that anywhere. What I would suggest is making it so it's the player in last that sets that timer. So, and they, they expect over time for you to add all of these yes. uh, and just slowly add them in. So you're not overwhelming the kids then. 
Yeah, exactly. And like I said, the final game should be with all of them. And I did play it that way a couple times. They, they we just didn't use the timer. It just one I didn't have my phone and we had to set a timer. All right. Well, now that we know how to play, what are your thoughts on this programming game from codemonkey.com? All right, so first off, caveat, uh, whatever, disclosure, I'm a huge fan of programming games. Uh, some of my favorite board games of all time are Robo Rally, Lords of Zitted. I even dig Colt Express with its silly theme. Now, my kids haven't played any of the go those games. Shame on me. I really should introduce them. They're old enough for all those now. They are huge fans of coding in general. So when I heard that Code Monkey, a fairly well-respected site, uh, about teaching kids how to code was releasing a board game, I jumped at the chance to check it out because I thought my kids would dig it. And they did. They loved this game. Like right now, as we speak, my oldest daughter is over at her grandmother's uh, who also lives with it, with uh, her aunt or whatever, Deanna's sister. And she brought the game with them to play. And say, but I really want to bring it. So I had her leave the lid of the box behind so we could have it for our backdrop tonight. The game's not over there. Now, at the same time, my younger daughter is mad because the oldest got to take Code Monkeys and now she can't play it. So for our kids, at least, Code Monkey Going Bananas was a complete hit. All right. Well, that certainly says something about the game design. As I admit, I haven't been sold on it so far, but then I'm 100% not the target market. Yeah. Agreed. Now that said, looking at this as an experienced gamer who's played thousands of games, this game does have some flaws that I think parents in particular should be aware of. While we loved the basic game, the, the, there's no special rules, you program three moves, it's lightning quick, games taking less than 15 minutes, all of the other modules kind of felt that they just bloated the game. They added complexity and they made the game longer, significantly longer. And I kind of missed that initial experience when we just played a couple rounds with the basic rules, running around. It was fast and furious. I do miss that a bit. Now, the biggest jump in playtime is adding traps. Another is playing with four players because the more monkeys there are, the more often you end up in each other's way. The thing is with these passes, they're straight pass. There might be a little drought out, but like the way you have to assemble it. So each tile, when you touch the other tile on one spot, means there's no circles. There's no ways around. There's no loops you can do. So it's hard to get around the other monkeys. And then traps add to this. So you now have not only monkeys in your way, you have traps in your way. So like it almost feels like half the tiles in the dungeon are covered. It doesn't get that bad, but it feels that way. Now this intensifies a ton. We are down to the last few bananas. They tend to be in one or two trees. And while everyone's trying to get to those same trees and trying to stop everyone from getting in those trees and everyone's just getting every other one's way. We actually had one game go for over an hour with players not able to gather the last two bananas just because it just kept getting blocked and blocked and trapped and blocked. And then when a trap happens, I lost a banana. And now there's one way over here too. And okay, someone went and grabbed that one. We're still down to the same two last bananas. Well, from that description, the game seems like it might get pretty old if you're in that same game for an hour yeah i suggested multiple times that we maybe just give the game to the person with the most bananas at the time and restart but my kids weren't interested in that now the rule book says add traps during your second play of the game or the second step you might play the first a bunch of times i say no like like save them for like the absolute last thing you add or at least wait until you have loops that way, there's a way to avoid those traps. Uh, they just make the game longer. Like, like, they're longer because they block people, but they also cycle the bananas back into the game. Now, another thing I considered trying was remove that. So you're not cycling them back in. A, a banana loss due to a trap is just removed from the game. And at least that way, the number of bananas keeps going down. And if you're down to those last couple ones, well, maybe they just get lost. Now, the magic card, well, interesting, had a similar effect. It, again, took bananas away from players and put them back in. So it just kept recycling the market. Now, I saw that as something that kind of falsely inflated the game, made it longer. My kids loved it, though. They love that module. They love laughing out loud whenever someone gets hit by a rotten banana. They, they're like, oh, 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 and they get all excited. And you're like, oh, oh, I think you played a rotten banana on the tree I'm heading towards. And then they, they cheer when it happens. So fair enough. I mean, rotten bananas are fun if you don't have to clean them up. Yes. We just save them all so we can make banana bread. <laughs> uh, 
Now, the other major issue I have with this game, and the biggest issue, honestly, I have with this game, is this is a programming game. It's sold as a, like, a, I don't know if they use the STEM term, but, like, they're, they're trying to sell it as, as an educational game where you're going to learn coding. The problem is your actual program that you make for your monkey doesn't matter most of the time. And this is due to the fact how rapidly the board state changes and how easy it is to block other monkeys, both again, with your monkey or your traps. Well, there's usually a pretty good chance your first planned out move. I'm going to go six and do this, and grab this. We'll go off as planned because it's your first move. And it shouldn't fail if you're the first player. If it fails on your first, if your first player and your first move doesn't get you where you wanted, that, that's on you. But once you get to the second, third, and fourth moves, there's almost no chance anything you planned during that planning programming phase will actually happen. Something will have changed in the board state so you can't do what your program was set up to do. Now, that said, when your plans are ruined, there is a fun element of trying to figure out how to adopt. Like, like you're stuck. You're, you're, you're programmed. You can't change your dice. You can't move things around. But how can you then use what's there well is kind of fun. And I've even had it where a bit of broken code, that get, like a bit of my code that gets broken by another player actually leads to a better turn because I was just planning on moving five. But now that you did this, I can now actually go here in seven nana. The thing is, like, like that's a fun moment, but this is a game about coding, and that just doesn't fit that goal of teaching the kids to code or giving them a coding experience. Deanna, in particular, um, liked this even less than I did. She hated the fact that you could spend minutes planning out the perfect turn. The turn where you're going to use both swing actions, you're going to go down after every banana, you're going to collect three bananas all in one go, only to have it ruined by the player before her doing something that ruins the plan in step one. Yeah, I I'm, I question rewarding accidental success in coding. Mm. Planning and thoughtful progression, logical steps, are how good, clean code gets written. Yep. I don't want my web browser working because someone's code was broken and turned out to end up being better that way by someone else's code. <laughs> yeah. That's... Now... Despite all these issues, uh, my wife and I both found Code Monkeys uh, going bananas. Like, we found these problems, but my kids love it. And I can't ignore that. I, I can't ignore the fact that my kids love ruining another player's plans. They giggle every time someone tries to go down when they're not in a tree. And they have this whole story about how their monkeys or their squirrels described as monkeys, disguised as monkeys, hiding, trying to dig and hide the bananas. And they talk about broken code. And they even now went and grabbed this Playmobil thing that plays out wah, wah, wah sound effect. And then they hit it every time someone codes broke. Like they, they, they love it. Um, they love when someone's forced to fall into a trap. Because remember, you always have to move your full movement. Uh, if possible. And well, if that movement's into a trap, you have no choice. You can't just go a different way. Um, they both asked to play this game multiple times since I taught them how to play. They're not sick of it yet. Seeing as this game is made for kids and not old Gronyard game players, hit, hit the mark. Yeah, so I, I'm torn now because it sounds like for the target market, it is a solid, fun game. But... It's from a company that's supposed to be teaching logical progression and practical programming in real languages. Mm -hmm. And they put out a game that doesn't really reinforce that. I mean, there's aspects of it there mm -hmm. without question, but it isn't as much of a focus as I would have expected coming from Code Monkeys. Yeah. And to be honest, if this wasn't from Code Monkeys, I might not have as much of a problem with it. Because like I said, when your code is broken and you manage to, find out a way to make it work that's very rewarding but that shouldn't be rewarding in code like you're not fixing your code you're dealing with the code you had now if right. there's some rule where you could like possibly fix your code using what's left or something and there's some kind of iteration that would all fit coding but yeah it's not there now to not be overly ne negative um this game looked great like i only have the prototype and i have to assume that the production will at least be the same if not better I love the way this game looks on the table. I took some great pictures I'll be sharing on my Instagram. Like, this is just a striking game. Um, now, there are a couple things I think could be improved. 
uh, like the trees only have the numbers on one side, and once you're using the magic uh, card, it really helps if everyone can see the numbers on the trees. Not quite sure why they're not on the top. And it would be nice to have the hexes not only numbered but color coded. And just even if it was lighter browns, like one was the lightest brown and six was the darkest. Because every now and then when the monkeys are like where the monkeys are standing made the pips hard to see. But everything works. Like, like, okay, can you just tell me what tree that is is fine? And is that a three or a four? I move your monkey for a second so it works. I was really impressed by this prototype. Like, like overall. Uh, as it stands, Code Monkeys Going Bananas is a great looking, quite fun game, despite its flaws. Well, I didn't love it at all. I, I had fun playing with my kids, though. My kids enjoyed it. I'm not the one that's supposed to be having fun. I'm not the target market. My kids are, and they adore it. Since the copy I played was a prototype, though, I do kind of hope that some of these issues we did find do get wrinkled out a bit before the retail version hits out. I'm hoping, you know, comments on the Kickstarter when it goes live, as well as, I, I don't know if the company will check out this review or not, but if they do, I hope they take some of what we had to say to heart. Like, if you've got kids that are into coding, especially if they know CodeMonkey, like CodeMonkey's a brand. People, it's been around since 2014. Kids have learned to code through CodeMonkey. I think it's a great choice. Like if you've got a kid that's already into the CodeMonkey brand, now you have a game to play with them. Yeah, it's uh, heavy on the, the the somewhat educational for for my money. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely. I don't know. I I, I have a hard, I'm not even sure if it's if you consider it. I, and to be honest, I don't know if they're marketing it as educational, but it's definitely marketed as coding game. Now, if you're thinking of getting your kids into programming, this might be a good way to start. Like just to get them excited about coding and then get them playing with monkeys. Um, they do have the added bonus. Uh, the Kickstarter's not live yet, but the, something they've announced on the, the pre-launch page is that if you back CodeMonkey, the game on Kickstarter, you are going to get a few months of CodeMonkey.com for free. So I don't know the price on that. Like maybe that actually even works out to a good deal and is cheaper than CodeMonkey normally costs. What I do worry just a bit is that they might learn bad habits. Like, like oh, I don't have to code that easy because I'll be able to fix it later would not be the lesson you want them to learn from this game. Yeah, as a fundraiser and branding tool for what is otherwise a really great program. My kids have used Code Monkey through school. It's, it's hard to complain too much, but <clears throat> there's still a taste. Yeah. So if you're looking for a detailed programming game that's going to help teach your kids to code, you're not going to find that here. Code Monkey Going Bananas features a very rudimentary coding system a system that combines with take that elements and interactions with other players that will regularly break the code. Now, overall, I thought CodeMonkey was an engaging mix of programming, take that and random elements that seemed to mix well for my kids. And in that case, you know what? My kids got a new game they love. So I am really happy about that aspect. Well, that's it for our look at a prototype copy of CodeMonkey Going Bananas. We welcome you to read more about this game in the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at games we played since last episode. Well, we've already talked at length about Sean Con, so I just want to highlight a couple games that I didn't play with Sean. Uh, first up was more exploration of the ADBW expansion for Unfair. We played a five-player game featuring aliens, B-movies, westerns, gangsters, and pirates. And I found that combat combat combo worked way better than the mix of three we did at ShineCon and gave me some real hope for the alien deck. Yeah, the alien is something you need to either, I think, focus on or avoid. It's hard to go partially alien, it seems, aside from just enough to try and spoil someone else who is trying yeah. to go all in on alien. I totally agree. Uh, the other thing I did find, which I was going to mention later, but I'll jump to it now, is I found that with Alien, if you let one player go all in, they're going to have a huge advantage. It's almost broken. But in this game, that's normal, right? You need to realize that you can't allow one player to go almost all in. And because of that, I think the Alien deck should be avoided until you're up to at least four players. 
because with two, you're almost forcing someone to go alien if another person does. Whereas with four, there's enough players that stuff should get spread around as much. And with five, I found it actually worked really well because when we played with five, everyone ended up with just a small amount of alien influence by the end of the game. And much to one player's chagrin because you know why they didn't want any. Uh, there is a blueprint that is avoid all alien stuff. Um, I, I really do think this one needs more players to shine and it did it worked great with five players yeah and again as as i was mentioning earlier enough deck knowledge system mastery could have helped that one player because yes there is a card that allows you to get rid of alien influence and turn it into cash yes uh, but you have to know that there is a not both that both there is a card that might give you influence if you don't want it mm -hmm. and that there is a card that can solve that problem yes and without knowing that those cards exist it puts you into position where you can think you're making for a home run and end up getting burnt in the end yeah but the problem is even knowing those cards exist which we did which is something else i was going to mention in a second uh you can still get burned because if there's only two copies of the event that lets you spend them and two other players have already spent them you're still stuck which is exactly how it played out the last time we played. Right. So a couple other things to note with five players is there's a lot of cards. Like, like for one, shuffling stank. Like trying to get the five decks randomized enough to not just draw like six alien cards in a row was, was a bit annoying. Um, blueprints, like just throw out what it says on them as far as if they're easy or hard. They're easy if you've already got the card done. And they're hard if you don't <laughs> like that's pretty much it um, because you have less players. Right. So trying to collect one of a cards, almost impossible. Uh, but even like simple ones, like I had a 10 point blueprint that is a thrill ride with three features. That sounds dead simple because thrill rides have all kinds of features you can add all the loop to loops and everything. I couldn't do it until the last round of the game where I just got BS lucky. Like, like it, that was supposed to be an easy, like that was 10 points. And there was no way like this was the first game because of that. We actually did. We referenced the unfair web page and we were passing around our cell phones to check how many copies of cards were every time we drew blueprints. Cause it got to that point where I think it would have been impossible to play otherwise. Yeah. I think um, while usually we use the discarding a card to pull five cards yeah. uh, as a sort of, Oh, I don't really have anything to do. I need to need to do something. I think when you get into those larger deck sizes, that needs to become more of a core mechanic where you need to force that mm. deck to cycle and you need to get more cards running through the table in order to be able to get your cards. Yeah. Like you need to force that that changeover in order to have any hope of, again, you know, yeah. filling blueprints and things like that. And again, though, even with that, if people know there's only one card, copy of a card, they hold on to it. And that's what was happening in this game was because we were looking up how many of a card there were, people were like, oh, there's only one of those? All right, I'll just hold on to that. And that happened, or that's what I'm going to discard after someone did their five or whatever. Like, there was definitely a lot more using the knowledge of how many cards were in the deck, which I got to admit I found a little annoying just personally. It just made the game longer, but I get why it happened, right? Like, yeah. I, what I, I mean, need it's to unfair. Do... <laughs> yeah. I, I, I get, I, like, I, I mean, you know, when, when, we were when we played our game, I held on to the turn alien influence into cash card just in for, case yeah. for as long as possible because I didn't know how many there were and yeah. I didn't want D to get a copy of it. Two. Yeah. There are two. There are but two. Said, we, most most of those cards, the event stuff, there tends to be two. Yeah. Um, two cards. So Yeah, exactly. Uh so uh, definitely different at five. I, I think I prefer it at four. I, I think four might be my my usual time. I'll play it at five. It didn't feel overly long. So digging into the specific decks, again, just looking at the, the new ones, Western's awesome. Like, like, I love Western. As I stated before, I wouldn't complain if every time I played Unfair from now to the end of the time, there was a Western deck in there. It's just, it's a well-balanced deck. It's simple. There's no funky rules. There's some great cards for expanding your your park which just adds to that remember the engine building the whole oh i feel good my park's so big so it just adds to that and there are tons of quality upgrades and it seems like so many blueprints not only from that deck but from all the decks require quality it tends to make overall the blueprints easier to achieve 
And that's why uh, even the manufacturer says it should be in every starter deck now. Yeah. Now, again, I already talked about the aliens, basically. Did work way better with this combo. Uh, everyone ended up with bits of it. Again, higher player counts. So I already kind of mentioned aliens. Then moving on to B-movies. Well, there's some stuff I love in this set. Like, I love the shop. The shop is one of my favorite attractions now. It's it's a thing that gives you money every round. It gives you an extra two bucks every round, plus four bucks per theme you put on it. I love that card. I want that in my park every time. I'll, I'll throw out all the blueprints if I can just keep collecting that extra money nice and early. I love that one. Um, I actually love the B-movie theme, which works similar. It's you get you play it on a card, and you get points for every theme that's already on that, that ride. I can't remember exactly how many. That one I dig. That one's cool. That one's like as good as Pirates, getting five bucks back. The big thing the Western or B movie ads though, is the panorama score. So I've now experienced this twice and it just didn't work the first time. Like no one seemed to do anything with it. So I decided to dive deeper. So in the back of the book of the, the expansion book is shows every pan, possible panorama. And that was shocking looking at that for the first time. I probably should have done this ahead of time. For example, every single panorama for the original six decks that come in the core game require you to have a specific super attraction or you can't complete them. And while you get two of those assigned to you randomly at the start of the game. So if you don't have any of them, you can't do it. Interestingly, every super attraction from the original game is also part of a panorama in an in interesting twist as well. Along with that, every single panorama requires at least one unique card with some requiring two or three unique cards. What this all means is they are way harder to score than I thought they would be. Like, I just thought once we had the panorama rules, people are going to be paying. So like this game, everyone did the pay three bucks to leave a gap and they used the billboards, which are supposed to be so you can build panoramas. No one completed anything that was bigger than a two card incomplete panorama, despite us trying. Yeah, I, I can't say I'm really surprised. Um, when you read out the scoring for them, that that first game and went through and, you know, the the, the summary of the scoring it was pretty shocking, which to keep a balance would mean it would be have to be just as tough to accomplish mm. as it is rewarding when you accomplish it. True. It just, it was worse than I thought. Like, like having to require super attraction. I almost feel like none of the blueprints require super attraction because you just draw that and you immediately throw it away if you don't have it. Like that, I, I realize it's, it's unfair, but that's like unfun. Like that's just like, you just gave me a garbage card I'll never be able to build. That's not fun. And, and it's not fun in an unfair kind of way. It's just like, why include that? And that's kind of what some of these panoramas felt like. I'm like, oh, now that I know I can't possibly ever complete this, then why am I even trying? And and yes, if we had done that research before we started playing the game, we wouldn't have made those mistakes. But that's what happens. You play with a daughter who's into AP and planning everything out too long and wants to know everything ahead of time before making your move. That's when the cell phones came out. So yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't love the B movie deck as much as I thought I did because of that. Yeah. Now I want to play a game where someone pulls it off. I want to see it. Now I think this is going to be opposite alien. I think that's going to be a two or three player game because there's less to cycle through and there's more chance you have those showcases. Right. All right. The other three decks were for or two decks. Sorry. We're from the base game. Uh, I dig them. I like pirate and gangster. They're both fun. I like the theaters or not the theaters, the hotels and the gangster deck are a lot of fun. Uh, the one thing we can't seem to no one's tried or figured out, and I'm sure it's supposed to be a big part is the offshore accounts in the gangster deck. It's a whole thing where you can put your money on them and they grow 20% every round or something like there's cards that are like, can't be combined with. So they have to be good. And it's like no one at our table has bothered to sit down to figure out what they should do with offshore accounts. So I think we're missing that part. Yeah, last time I played a game with Gangster and AD got that card. So I haven't actually played with it yet. And there's four of them in there. It's like oh, one wow. of those they kind of expect you all to have an offshore account. Hmm. So I don't know. It's, it's the one aspect of that deck we haven't quite dived deep enough. Delved? Delved deep enough? Now, the other game I've been playing is Code Monkeys. Uh, wow, my kids are hooked, like really hooked. Uh, the first day I broke it out, we played four games in a row, um, adding modifications as we went. The next day we played some more. We even got Deanna to play with us. Um, then we just, I wanted to see how it played with four players. And then I wanted to also try it with the full rules. Again, I did not try the, the countdown timer. I can see what's going to happen with that. I don't, I didn't feel the need. I had to try it. Now, as I've already stated in the review, I was not a huge fan of this game. 
It has some issues. Um, some issues I do hope they iron out a bit during the Kickstarter, but it doesn't matter. My kids loved it, right? It's kind of like you go defending Candyland on multiple episodes because you had fun playing it with your kids, which really that's the most important thing. Um, this one too, I'm just a small part of me is going to be tempted to bring this out in public at local game stores and stuff just because of how good it looks at the table and making sure people aren't taking it seriously, knowing that it's your code's going to break. No, like laugh about it. It's more of a take that game than a coding game. And I could see a bunch of uh, punch drunk adults having fun with this uh, late on extra life or possibly actual drunk adults having fun with this one as well. So I may keep it around. Uh, well, the kids already have asked, can we put this one on our game shelf? Cause they have their own shelfy. So I think it's going to be staying around either way. All right. Well, speaking of uh, the coming weekend, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So the big thing, as we mentioned in the announcement section, is Extra Life Tabletop Appreciation Weekend is hitting this weekend. So I'm expecting to get in a ton of gaming, both digital and physical. We'll see if we can top SeanCon and get more than 11 games in. With digital plays, we should be able to, but I don't know if it'll be 11 different games. Um, in addition to that, Deanna and I have a new deck builder to try out. It is called the Red Bernoose. This is a game set during the French invasion of Algeria, where you're actually playing the indigenous people, the Algerians, trying to stop the colonizers, the French. So I already dig the theme. Um, looks like a mix of war game, folk on a map with um, deck building. And the deck building in this is very different because you have like man, woman, like Algerian man, Algerian woman, Algerian child are the kind of cards you're building your deck with. So looks very different from other deck builders I played. So I am looking forward to checking that out. I was really hoping Sean could get in and play before we needed to do the review, but this one's launching in Kickstarter on September 18th. So that's literally one month away from today. So I don't think there's gonna be time to fit that one in. Um, there's also a year on that. I probably should catch what that is. It's the Red Burnus with the year. I'm gonna Google that. 72? Now I can't remember how to spell Bernoose. <laughs> 1857. So the Red Shoot. Bernoose, Algeria, 1857. I meant to look that up before we went live. I just put Red Bernoose in the, in the I, show. I had looked it up, and I did. Yeah, it was close. I meant not, to do not it. close enough, though. Shoot. Yeah, we're looking forward to checking that one out. As for what we're going to play at a Tabletop Appreciation Day, I, maybe we should plan that. I don't know. We oh. are going to play a game of Space Base. That's planned. Um, I do have some other people who have asked to join in if we are playing online. So I'm thinking we might at some point set up a game of code names or code names duet because there's like, I, I think it's like play code names or something. There's like a web version of code names that works great. You just join and pick a team and then you only see your team stuff, right? Right. That looks really cool. So I do have some uh, some friends of Sean Hamilton that would like to join in if we could. So we might open up some bigger tables. Um, it'd be awesome if some of our fans could join us. So watch our social media. Maybe we'll put a shout out a call for players we'll probably throw that on our patreon discord first but if we're looking for players maybe you can join us and play some games all right now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our vip guests our patreon backers we greatly appreciate their support welcome roy lamb our latest tabletop bellhop patreon patron thank you so much for your support roy Joe Swick. Thanks, Joe. Evil John. Looking forward to some Extra Life Gaming this weekend. Donna, thank you for all the interactions and joining us live so often. Courtney Jackson, the same goes for you. We love having such an active community. And ironically, neither of them were here for our live show tonight, but they're usually here. I one one was earlier, but... Oh, there you go. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. Also, I'd like you to please consider tipping your bellhop. You can do that at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop to get some awesome bonus content that we put out every week. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us and stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you.
and, and game, game on. on.